So I'm the last one here in botany, and I'm also a historian, um, actually art historian, specialized in photography, who turned towards uh, scientific illustration through a book that I wrote under this roof on the photographer Carl Blossfeld, um, who was a plant photographer, and it uh, came out uh, last year during the pandemic. <laughs> so there was no party, uh, as there usually is in, uh, in this house. And uh, so I teach the history of um, scientific illustration in the Zurich Art School, the ZHDK, Zurich University of the Arts, and I um, often use Florica's books, so I'm glad we got to hear some of these concepts. Um, I want to show you uh, two projects of um, our students, but also give you a little introduction about our program. It's a very small a bachelor and master's program. Um, we only have about eight to ten students in the bachelor every year. And when they arrive, they all arrive um, with their sketchbooks. And in my theory class, I don't teach in the studio. I'm glad Simone, um, Simone Monhardt is here. So if you have any questions about studio work in our um, program, she can uh, give the answers. But in my theory class, they all arrive with their sketchbooks and their pencils, and they take notes in pencil, <laughs> which is really nice because you know they're not on the internet while you're talking. Um, but then, by the second year, they all uh, come with an iPad. And so there's this change. In the first year, we do the, the actually only formal artistic training that is still being taught um, in Zetadeka. It's in our program, so we do um, drawing um, in uh, the light and shade studies, watercolor, the the whole thing in a re relatively fast uh, program. We also teach oil painting still in the two weeks um, excursion in the mountains where they actually go out and they paint in the landscape. Um, so, but by the second year, it's all digital. Some of them use, uh, which is also maybe interesting for the question of the paper, they use a foil on their iPads that um, imitates the texture of paint. Uh, of uh, paper. Yes. So, um, and then of course, we do a lot of um, work that is far away from actual observational drawing, and uh, two examples that I will show you um, have, have both have something to do with um, drawing, but I'm stretching the definition a little bit here. Um, maybe also just as an introduction to um, when they finish their bachelor's or when they get into their bachelor year, they collaborate with institutions already, with ETH, University of Zurich, hospitals, also in Germany, the Charité in Berlin, the Max Planck in Leipzig, and so on. And all of the bachelor works are already applied works that are often find uh, a way of being published um, or somehow used in three different fields. We do what we call science to science, which is sort of being an embedded designer in a research project, um, education, illustrating textbooks, um, working on e-learning tools and uh, serious games. And the third is scientainment. That's a very large growing field for us now which is, uh, for example, interactive uh, tools for museums, uh, a lot of mu um, museum um, animations, VR, AR applications, and so on. So uh, the first one I would like to show you, let's see if this, I hope it works, um, is the project by Nina Schwartz. She finished last year, and it was a collaboration with the Botanical Garden in Bern, Let's see. And uh, the idea was to illust or to create a pedagogical tool. Do I need one finger or two? Uh. <laughs> no. Yeah, I can show you here. Um, the idea was to explain to a large public what um, ex situ cultivation means for the protection of species, so you actually take them out of their um, endangered species, species out of their nor normal living conditions, you plant them in the botanical garden, and then uh, you plant, replant them in the wild. And um, she created six 
portraits of uh, flowers, of endangered flowers, and then she created one uh, didactic panel which explained this process of protecting species in the botanical garden. Uh, now, it's always nice to use your own computer because... It must be two fingers. Okay. Ah, yeah, there we go. Okay, so this is this um, larger panel, but I'm really interested more in showing you the six portraits. Here's one. Each um, portrait, so these are um, classical information signs, and um, each one has one large um, in, image in color with a title that relates sort of to as if it were a character in a play. Here's the rare one, the grand, the delicate. We'll come back to them. The deceitful one. The um, unimpressive and mousy one sort of and the attractive one. So why am I interested in this project, especially there aren't very many botanical projects in our field. Uh, we teach a lot of um, archaeological reconstruction and medical illustration and, and then also just goes into very broad fields. But, but botany is at the moment rather rare. And this is really an, an outstanding project, we all uh, believe. I'll show you the delicate one a bit more in detail. I like this project because it's not about, only about communicating botanical information, but it's a project that actually um, reflects drawing as a means of communicating in the botanical sciences. I don't know if you really see it that well. Um, so we have this, uh, the one, the, the specimens that are uh, paint, uh, drawn in color, and then we have a enlar large enlargement on the left side in pencil, and um, another drawing that is more like a technical drawing, that is a cross section of the plant, of the flower, and obviously textual information, but, um, what is really special about this whole thing is that you can actually see the process of drawing by seeing that it, 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 she kept the auxiliary lines, the constructive lines. She um, shows in the large plant that um, this is sort of a procedural way of drawing, going from the general to the, to the detailed one. And you see that uh, down here you have still, it's almost like in a sketch still, very um, f fading out in the back, whereas you have in the center of this flower you have a very detailed way of drawing. Um, and then you have obviously three different types of how to use drawing to give um, different information. And this happens through all of these um, uh, these six portraits that you have these different forms and that you have the constructive um, lines still in the back. Also, this hatching is still visible in the back. Um, and in her documentation, which we have on our website, they always, usually they have an exhibition, but this was during the pandemic, so we had an, this, all of this is digital, which is great because we can show you. Here, um, she has these little animations where you can see how she was drawing. And contrary to its look, all of this is digital, entirely digital. And that's also why we're able to see all these different layers of drawing um, that she shows in the animation. You see it also in color, what uh, different stages of the uh, coloring of the images. Then she shows a few studies of how coloring can influence the form, the appearance of form. And what I wanted to show you at the end, all kinds of studies that went preliminary studies, conceptual sketches, layouts and so on. But what I want to show you here is the facts. She has 1,151,621 pencil strokes for the final image, 
which brings us away from that crafty look of the images and reminds us again that this is an entirely numerical process and absolutely absurd information that makes everybody laugh when you hear about it. So this is really um, a way of showing drawing as a construction, using auxiliary lines, um, constructing first a large composition and then going into detail. And the second project I would like to show you is um, actually already open here. Um, here I'm stretching the definition of drawing very much because what I'm showing you here is now a 3D model, what we, um, we call a tangible 3D model because it works with a sensor. Um, it's by um, our former student and now professor Alessandro Holler, in, who worked in a team together with interaction design and game design. And it illustrates the largest flower that exists in the world, the Titan Votes. It's the corpse flower. It blooms only every two or three years for a day or two. It's huge. It's up to three meters high. And so it's... Uh, a very exciting moment when these flowers bloom. And um, what he did is he uh, constructed a 3D model, or three, virtual 3D model, obviously, um, which um, is interactive. And I'll show you a short sequence of a movie about it. So, I'm kind of blind here. It's in German, unfortunately. I hope it's An der Zürcher Hochschule der Künste wurde die Titanwurz in ein digitales Modell übersetzt. Alessandro Holler ist Botaniker, wissenschaftlicher Illustrator und Teil des Projektteams. Das Erlebnis, diese große Blume vor mir zu sehen, so als hätte ich zum ersten Mal wirklich den Aufbau einer Blüte verstanden. In Zusammenarbeit mit Experten aus Game- und Interaction-Design wurde ein interaktives Ausstellungsmodul entwickelt. Dank dem berührungslosen Leap-Motion-Controller kann man die Blume mit eigener Kraft zum Blühen bringen, sie drehen und ihr Inneres bestaunen. Tangible Virtual Models wurde schon mehrmals der Öffentlichkeit zugänglich gemacht. Als Teil einer größeren Ausstellung zum Thema Modelle, aber auch an Events und Präsentationen, konnten Besucher mit der Titanwurz interagieren. Das Team sammelte wertvolle Erfahrungen und konnte das Modul stetig weiterentwickeln. Die Installation muss aber nicht person drawing and the viewer through this um, leap motion detector um, is actually interacting with the not only with the plant and I would even say that the didactic part of it um, of really learning about this plant is not that big um, but it the fun factor of this whole um, project is that as an observer as a uh, as a user interactive user you are actually drawing this plant, you are making it, you, you're developing the drawing, you're altering the drawing, you're making it grow and, and uh, turning it around and so on. So your movements become a, a gestural way of drawing. It's almost like a sort of dance or performance of drawing. And this is a um, concept, this idea that The plant um, is drawing and the drawing is growing like a plant is an idea that I um, encountered in many reviews on the photographer Karl Bosfeld. And I would like to read to you a few um, quotes. 
Of course, well, also there was there's one that you might know that was always can um, compared to the dancer. I didn't bring it, unfortunately. There's a one um, bot that really looks like a dancing person and has its uh, arms on top. So this equation was done very often, but um, the equation between drawing and plant growth um, is mentioned, for example, in the Times Literary Supplement in 1932, where it says. There are, I'm quoting here, there are measurable ratios in a definite progression between energy, resistance, and form in the growth of a plant, so that the plant is a sort of graph of its own activities. So that's the idea of seeing the plant draw itself while it is growing. And the same idea, but seen from the other side, is... Um, formed in, uh, by the French painter André Lotte in an essay which he called The Unconscious in Art, published in Transition magazine in 1937, um, which you see here in reproduction, um, with uh, pumpkin tendrils photographed by Blossfeld. Lord claims that the example of Dürer's drawings that the great masters all used curves as main lines in their early sketches and constructed geometrical drawings with straight lines in their more advanced works. And I'm reading a quote from Lord now. Since it is a constant feature of the spontaneous drawings of the masters to have curves as a basis, and since the drawings that they produce most carefully have straight lines and geometry as a basis, it seems to me that one can hazard the opinion that the curve, the unique element of our spontaneous instinctive expression, is the sign of the relaxation of reason, the symbol of some vital and profound urge. What this urge is, I hesitate to suggest and leave the task to the psychologists and psychoanalysts. But in a spiritless way, I will compare the symbol itself with the marvelous twisting of a plant drunken with liberty and pleasure. If we consider the acanthus leaf in its full vital enjoyment, nothing can give a more perfect idea of the happiness of being delivered from every constraint than this drunkenness of the leaf as it unfolds, stretches itself, turns back upon itself, describes yet another volute, then begins once more that love dance in the light." The tendrils of creepers that unroll like the interiors of seashells never stop tracing their dizzy flourishes. Nothing gives me more the sensation of unfettered genius than these stalks, mad with their own bodies. End of quote. So the line that draws the plant is the same here as the line that the plant draws. The amniotations would say, the sign becomes the object, or the signifiant becomes the signifié, and vice versa. The differentiation of curved, spontaneous, organically growing drawing, we heard of something about the living line before when the architects were here. And geometrical drawing is, of course, a very old idea. Going back to the Renaissance, diseño theory, differentiating between the fine arts and the mechanical craft, something that has come up also already. And you had a great comparison between um, Da Vinci's plant, the Bethlehem star, and some whatever technical drawing, which really showed this that he was drawing one all in curves and the other all in angles. Um, <clears throat> Blosfeld's mentor, the late 19th century ornamentics teacher Moritz Moyer, um, developed his own drawing class and he made students first learn to draw a plant geometrically with a ruler and a compass and then only after they were able to understand the geometries of the plants made them uh, draw a real specimen freehand. So this was the other way around from what Lot was promoting is that first you go spontaneous and then you start constructing the image. I would challenge both of them, André Lot and Moritz Mohr, and say that the two modes of drawing are not a before and after, but they're two ways of observing the world, two distinct ways of observing an object. And Nina Schwartz's project shows that geometrical drawing can be just as well um, as spontaneous and have the spontaneity of a draft as a um, vegetal organic kind of line. So in this, if this is the case, I'm 
opening this session maybe with a few questions that we might talk about now or also maybe later in the day, um, which would be, if there are these two ways of drawings, constructive and organic, the first is commonly seen in architecture and the other ones in botany and medical illustration, maybe. But then actually we see that both exist in either one. And my question would be what epistemic value does either one have in the wrong discipline? So what does organic drawing do in architecture and what does geometric drawing do in botany and medicine? And then um, if these are and are these two opposing ways of drawing really the two ends of a linear spectrum, or are there other ways? And that would be a question for the artists here in the room. <laughs> other ways um, of drawing, other modes of drawing, and other ways of, of, of observation, which would lead to different knowledge about the object, uh, objects observed. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. It was a very um, widely varied set of presentations, and I think to go from the 16th century examples through your own practice that is in, in kind of dialogue to the 16th century and bringing us to the 21st century with the kind of <clears throat> con connection to past drawings, but very much uh, past techniques, but very much using uh, present technologies was really, uh, it's a wonderful kind of panorama. Um, sorry. <coughs> I wanted to take up a, a few questions. The ones that you posed are also, are also excellent, and I want, I want to come back to those as well. Um, but one thing that interests me as a kind of um, perhaps slightly different concern than the ones that we talked about in the first session about architecture um, and that maybe you posed, or particularly Jesse, is this issue of um, accuracy and precision in botanical drawing, and how that um, those objectives then create a kind of um, dialogue with the scientific world. So one one thing that you brought up, uh, Florica, was that this issue of who's making the drawings for whom. And so Conrad Gessner is this interesting example of someone who's both the naturalist and the person with the, with the pencil, or well, the, not a pencil, but a pen or a writing instrument in his, and a drawing instrument in his hand. Um, although he was also commissioning other people, we know, of course, Leonardo da Vinci was making his, absolutely making his own drawings. Someone like Aldrovandi, I think, was was not making his own drawings, but was in um, was working with commissioned with other commissioned artists. Um, now, um, or and then also in terms of these issues of accuracy and and precision, you were mentioning this was just over dinner last night, Jesse. You were mentioning that, or you were quite also specific in your talk to say I'm I'm not technically a botanical artist because there are so many rules and expectations about that. But I guess my um, question is, and this may be slightly beyond our scope, but I'm curious about, um, so now botany has become something more like plant biology, right? It's not quite known as the same thing and so forth. But um, plant biologists, I think, are still dependent on you know, they need textbooks, they need illustrations of some kind. And so is, does that, um, the relation to scientists today in plant biology, does that also um, affect the expectations of how scientific illustrators are drawing, how bot botanists are drawing, and so forth? Or... Um, or is there some, are there some other factors? So I've said that in quite a roundabout way, but another way of saying it is if you think of the 16th century analog of a partnership between a naturalist and an artist, what does that look like today? Anybody? Any sense? Do you know? So, with, so the, I guess I can be specific towards, or start with you, Jesse. Like, so these, the society of botanical artists that you were referring to, and maybe you could tell the audience a little bit more about it. Are, are they um, illustrating scientific textbooks, or are they, is it a kind of aesthetic 
objective or yeah. yeah. So there are essentially several different groups and uh, different functions and different expectations. So most strictly, if you talk about botanical illustration, it has a very specific function for botanists of today. And of course, that really requires the botanical illustrator to uh, look at plants in a similar way as the botanist. So um, they don't really care for colors. Uh, color is not a, an important factor. So a lot of times is these pretty much like um, very small details that uh, people will want to visualize. So those uh, botanical illustrators, they have a critical role in communicating with the um, botanist or plant biologist and then really try to um, see the way they do and then sort of produce the illustration that will be useful for them. Uh, but what is often called a botanical artist today a lot of them work with uh, transparent watercolor, and the goal is, um, of course, there are different schools, but the most active school, um, they want to present uh, pieces that are pretty true to nature in the way that they almost look like photographs. And there are leeways, but there are also a lot of rules in terms of, for example, you should draw from a live specimen, um, you should have this accuracy. So the same discussions are always there, but how each group sort of navigate around it become different. And also, uh, it depends on whether or not you're producing these botanical art for competition, um, for maybe like a botanical garden project that they want to have a compilation of um, flora in their gardens, or in some other ways, conservation science. Um, of a friend of mine, she's a sort of a botanical artist from India, and she does these really like plant conservation type of illustrations that instead of taking plants out of their context, she puts them back into sort of like the environmental um, consideration. So that has a different set of uh, aesthetic and requirement as well. So it's not a very straightforward, okay, follow this rule and then you are a botanical artist. And everybody's definition of what botanical is can also be different. So uh, what I find most productive, it usually comes first from whatever images I'm looking at and then place them back into sort of their contemporaneous context and historical context to see what are the biggest discussions or debates of the time and then look into if there is anything that I can personally relate to, um, not to claim that that's what they were thinking about, but use practice as a way to think for myself. Mm -hmm. It's, I, I'm curious in the, yeah, in the context of um, the s teaching students about scientific illustration and so forth, do the, are, are there scientists that come into the, to, um, the school to kind of like be in dialogue with the students or help the instruction and so forth? Or is there just the idea that, well, if we produce the most kind of accurate and and seemingly objective i mean objective is such a problematic word um but are we like do they imagine what they're trying like what the scientists are hoping to gain from these from their illustrations or is there a conversation that takes place i think the example that you showed with the um for the Bairn botanical garden there's an actual client right so so that's much more concrete you're not having to imagine what somebody might want um, but yeah, what what does that conversation look like in the in the school? Yeah, it looks very different from what you said in our school. <laughs> I would say is that first of all, we do have collaborations, but since these are bachelor projects, they are extremely open. We don't want to be in service, sort of right. doing you a don't service want to, be to doing anybody. Unpaid so, labor for so when she was working with the botanical garden. They, she could have done anything, you know, it could have been an iPad app or an iPhone app for visitors or whatever. I mean, mm. she was totally free to do whatever she wanted to do. Um, and I think um, we don't teach like accuracy of drawing or mm. observation, of course, in the beginning to get the, you'll correct me, <laughs> um, to learn the craft, but very soon we go into more of, of Questions of mediation. Mm -hmm. What does the image want to say? Who, what is the, who is, who are we addressing? 
Um, and that um, being under the roof of the Flex Center, I think still, um, you know, goes back to I usually use Flex idea of esoteric and exoteric forms of knowledge. If you are within the science to science um, domain, you are it's scientists talking to scientists. They have totally different ways of communicating. They don't need maybe a lot of details, but specific details that they're talking about. Uh, the next step would be textbooks, handbooks, and so on, which are already a bit further away from where the knowledge is actually produced. And then, of course, the scientainment form is more um, doing, making it available to a large public, which mm. needs, again, a totally different right, visual different language. Format. Yeah, so, yeah. And each time a different solution. Um, mm. It's interesting. So this phrase, what does the image want to say? I mean, that's interestingly... Uh, kind of animist for the, for the drawing itself, but I would maybe relate it back to Annette's comment in the first session about, you know, what do, what do I want to say about the tree or what do I see in the tree and so forth. And I guess that's a kind of interesting question maybe for all of you about, um, you know, um, to what extent, of course, Jesse, you spoke about the artist is making selections. You, you know, you also showed many examples in which Gesner and other artists are m making a series of choices. But I think um, the, because the, the object is one that where we're trying to get kind of information about, you know, the life of the plant and the seed and so forth, we tend to maybe minimize as historians and art historians what these... Uh, we don't think of it uh, as artistic expression, right? We, we think of it as about the plant. Um, and so, yeah, I'm curious and, like, I feel like you're saying what the image wants to say is slightly evasive, <laughs> not deliberately, but, I mean, it's a way around asking, like, what is the the hand that's drawing um, and the eye that's behind the hand seeing in the plant? Like, are is is the training recognizing that kind of um, selective autonomy and and those artistic choices, or is it trying to place that that agency somewhere somewhere else? I don't know if if you have or I mean, Florica, if you see kind of his critiques of the 16th century drawings, which are saying like personal or this is too or or there's not enough information here or do you see any debate about this kind of questions of of um how how faithful how true the language might be about um you know how yeah I Vera, think, the, mm, the it's, it's a difficult question because in a way you're talking about like we let's say um trying to interpret the motivations of depicting like that and with those means, meaning like watercolor, pen, uh, pencils, um, brushes, and on diff different types of material as well, in that period mm -hmm. by certain people who worked sometimes for other people uh, for certain purposes that we mm. also try, and all of this we try to reconstruct basically from the image, yeah. not from texts right, about right. those images. Because only in a very few cases of the very famous artists and of some of the very famous collectors, uh, naturalists, there are a few words about why they did what they did mm -hmm. in that way. So basically, we try it's to sort of deduce from right, the image right. back into the motivation of yeah. why does it look like that, that plant mm -hmm. like that, but also why is it depicted like that. Mm. So it's a reconstruction on the basis of, I can't say guesswork, but it comes into you know, sort of heavy interpretation. Mm. As Jesse said, trying to combine what you see with what we can learn from textual sources, usually mm. about the debates of the period. And those debates are about accuracy, very much so. Mm -hmm. uh, but what accuracy means in right. the 16th right. century and now is not exactly the same thing. And it's not exactly clear. I mean, I think no. one other thing that became, in, or was an interesting theme that came up and is um, important for botanical drawings is the issue of time. That, you know, as you said, like if you start drawing a flower now and you finish two weeks later, it's not the yeah. same flower. And so which slice of time is, is you know, the, one, the true one? That's, yeah. it's not at yeah. all, uh, it's not at all self-evident. Um, and that's actually another, 
uh, I think, interesting theme between some of the um, your presentations is about um, how tech, you know, different interpretations of technology, whether it's mm. the technology of print or uh, the technology of the kind of animated drawing. I mean, an animation is an interesting case where actually it does, it allows you to address that time, time and uh, decay and so forth. It, it's, it adds something. Print, um, I mean, perhaps even more than drawing, fixes, right? It, like it, in a sense, does the opposite, right? Because mm -hmm. it, it fixes a particular image and then repeats it. Um, but but, but yeah. if you think, for instance, of something that did happen fairly often in the 16th century and I, a little bit now as well, is painting with the colors that are made of the plant itself. Mm, yeah. And so there you're talking about a process in which we know that happened in certain cases, mm -hmm. which you can interpret in terms of accuracy. Mm. Like this, you know, if you use that yellow of the sunflower to paint the petals of the yellow sunflower on, on paper or on parchment, right. which is much finer, yeah. uh, then what does this actually mean? Does it talk about accuracy? Right. Or is it about like, you know, conveying the spirit of the sunflower to mm, that mm. parchment? Or does it have actually an alchemical meaning? Right. Uh, possibly. Uh, it's or is it about a medicinal interpretation yeah. in which, you know, the substance of the, the color uh, somehow gets conveyed to, via the plant and the paper to, you know, a, a future user or something? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I'm guessing here, I can't usually tell. But there are certain cases in which the documentation is there to show that people did this systematically, painted plants in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. And we are, you know, the, yeah, thinking about the possibilities of how to look with the eyes of the people making Right, that. trying to understand then, what those yeah. choices meant yeah, to them. which is yeah. not our eyes. And the same, dis the discussion about ad vivum painting and, you know, lifelike painting, mm. what the ad vivum means turns out turned out to be like going from a very dead plant indeed which was not even seen alive by the, the painter mm. to actually copying somebody else so having right. never seen the plant at all or the animal yeah. but copying somebody else who can be trusted right sort of yeah uh, as a source so i mean there again this notion of accuracy comes in mm. but there are other notions as well and I think we can't, we can't really discard any of them at the moment. We can have them as, also as combinations. Right, so. right. The, no, the point about plain, painting with the, the pigment from the plants itself is a fascinating kind of mm. case of a, another whole, it's, mm. it's a directness and another whole way of thinking about mm. um, what a representation does, that if it's actually part of yeah. the thing. Yeah. I want to, yeah, we're, uh, I, please, please, <laughs> I want to open it up for questions. Um, please, Annika. Uh, let's see, let me just get you the, uh, yep. So I have a question for Ulrike. Mm -hmm. I was a little bit curious because today we are here talking about drawings and then this morning we had architects talking about drawing. And I know that Carl Blosfeld, he was actually teaching ornament. He mm -hmm. was an architect, he was teaching um, architectural drawing to his students and he uses the medium of photography to show the plants. And mm -hmm. then of course in a highly stylized form. Mm -hmm. So what you were reading about the Icantus, he was actually te teaching ornament for buildings in a bizarre kind of way. Mm -hmm. And we only know him as a photographer. I mean, he got famous as a photographer, but he was actually teaching architecture. Yes, he's actually not even teaching drawing, but modeling mm -hmm. after yeah, plan. Exactly. So there's a three-dimensional aspect to it. So I was wondering if you could say something more in relation to that. In, um, because I was actually curious that you presented the photography and not the, 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 the more drawing matter or the modeling matter of Blosfeld. Mm -hmm. Because it's a totally different context since it's not the botanical context. Blossfeld was even manipulating the plants so they would look like a, an architectural ornament. So uh, this is yeah, yeah. like a different story, yeah, yeah. I okay. think. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, write about it in your book? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, which I have in my it's desk. Somewhere. It's it must be an, yeah, somewhere I have here. It on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. 
Uh, Sebastian. So thank you uh, for those presentations. My question goes in the direction um, of conveying knowledge um, through, uh, here in this case, botanical drawings. So I, I guess how you depict a plant uh, depends very much on what you know about this plant and its relatives, and this is also what is then important for, um, I mean, a lot of the use of these depictions is in order, in order to distinguish between different types of uh, uh, related plants, and so I think it's, it's um, and that might also be a reason why depiction of plant is, uh, plants have changed over time because the knowledge about plants and its relatives mm -hmm. and what are the cr critical features that really distinguishes this particular species from another species is something that has grown over time. And so I think it is, it's also um, an, an aspect of uh, the state of knowledge in the, in, in the depictors mind but also in, in, in the field. And the second question, if I may, um, has to do with the, the, the question how the field has shifted here in, in, in botany in particular with uh, photography because plants have the huge advantage in comparison to birds that they don't run away and, um, <laughs> and therefore you can actually carefully select a very good plant, take a very good photographic shot of it and now I would say in lots of um, also, highest quality um, uh, plant guides, you have often photography, whereas I, I would say in bird guides, you still often have um, drawings because it's, it's much harder to actually catch a typical uh, photography of, of, of a bird than, for example, a plant. Two questions, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? Should I take the second one, maybe? <laughs> sure. <laughs> because you were saying the typical specimen, and that's maybe the point, is that for a photograph, you always have an individual and never the typical, so that's where drawing comes in. And there's a funny essay that you would find in the Internet called uh, Five Reasons Why, my ca why a Camera Won't Steal My Job um, for uh, scientific illustrators. <laughs> Um, and well, some things are obviously things are some things are too small or too large to f be photographed. So you draw them. Um, and I don't remember all of them, but that's something to look at. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what yeah. else? Um, well, that, I, I was just going to say that's also. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci wrote something that was basically like, why now that everybody's dissecting, nobody will steal my job? <laughs> um, because, you know, when he was initially making dissections of humans, it was, or human anatomy, it was difficult just to get access to the bodies, but then with Vesalius and so forth, it became, there were more available, but his claim about them was also about this issue of the typical, because he his claim was that he, he dissected 100 bodies in order to get to one drawing. And so that he'd done that work, and he'd, he'd figured out what the, essentially what the typical was um, by massive amounts of study. And I suppose you could, it's, it's part of the work of the scientific illustrator as well, to do that le active abstraction through... Um, massive study. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I would also add, um, first of all, that the camera obviously is a very important issue that I was sort of missing also out in the architect's discussion because th this morning it was sort mm -hmm. of, it sounded like um, all architects no do nothing but draw. <laughs> <laughs> but they obviously also go out and they make sound recordings, they film, they, you know, there's so many different ways of, of um, perceiving um, space and, and the social space also. So that's important to say that we don't have this little nostalgic, mm -hmm. nostalgic little round here also with speakers who are all not digital natives, obviously. So and that this might falsify the picture also a little bit. Um, Florica, did you have? Yeah, maybe to come back to, the, to, the, to your first question. Um, I think you it sounded a little bit, but maybe I'm wrong, as if you said there is a certain type of knowledge in the painter's eye, um, brain, sorry, and eye, maybe, um, and that determines how they depict. But could you reverse it? Or, I mean that basically by depicting 
the knowledge is being created. Um, because that is exactly the, the, the point, let's say, where I'm, in which I'm interested. Um, if you look at the early modern period, I, it might be the same for, for the modern period, but <clears throat> I simply know less about that. <clears throat> but if I, sorry, if I see, let's say, what's happening in the, between 1500 and 1600, that is an explosive uh, growth in the number of plants being depicted and, dis and described in great detail. So we're talking detailed depicting and detailed describing, going to pages about one plant, that sort of thing. Detail, detail, detail. And basically, my idea is that the description in detail runs parallel with the depiction in detail, and that that, that is actually making the knowledge uh, of being able to distinguish between more and more subspecies and sub-subspecies, meaning finer distinctions between plant species. So uh, I assume, or I, I think, that the, basically the knowledge is not there in the head and then being projected into a painting, but vice versa. But I might be putting this too simplistically. Uh, first of all, I would say, you know, if anyone uh, should claim uh, the, the right to speak uh, in a simplifying manner, then it's me because I know nothing about it. <laughs> but um, um, but uh, what I would, I would say, it's, uh, what I can imagine is that it's really a process uh, um, th that uh, feeds feeds back, really. So, I mean, you're seeing, you're depicting, and uh, then you're seeing more... And I think this is a, is a process of knowledge gain that presumably also reflects itself in what features of a plant have been depicted at a particular time, uh, period of time. Um, really because I think you begin only... You, I guess it's very difficult to do a very accurate... Um, a depiction of, uh, well, in, also in, in the context of trying to find a typical plant which requires this knowledge that you have seen many specimens of this particular, and then identifying the characteristic feature of this one versus related species, that is a, a process of knowledge gain, and presumably this is an iterative thing. Mm -hmm. To your thing, was photography obviously also a, a, somebody who takes a a, a good photo of a plant can only do that after having seen hundreds and mm -hmm. thousands of this and really knowing exactly at what moment and what's mm -hmm. characteristic and what features do you need to focus on in order to allow to distinguish between related uh, plants. So I think it's the process, whether you're a photographer or, or, or somebody who, who draws, it's, it, it requires this knowledge um, and understanding, uh, developing of an understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we should okay. go ahead. One, one little thing to add, which intrigues me a lot, and it's not to, about plants, but about fish, and, uh, depicting fish. And one of the, um, the, the curious things about the early modern period is that for plants, you have a fairly ongoing tradition through the Middle Ages into, via herbals and so into the 16th century and onwards. So there's a long uh, descriptive and visual tradition for fish There is not. And the people in the 16th century who start producing large illustrated fish books and you know albums of, of drawings in the 1550s, they have to work with zero. Basically, they start a new visual tradition because the antiquity tradition is there, but it wasn't visu visible on the whole because archaeology had was very you know mm -hmm. limited. Digging up hadn't been done. The marble floors of the Romans weren't there, and so on. So basically, that could not have been a visual inspiration, but it was a textual. And there was no other visual tradition going through the Middle Ages. So what you see is an explosion of like hundreds and hundreds of images in the 1530s of fish, which are very naturalistic, very detailed, very coloured. And where does this come from? I mean, obviously from observation, which is already difficult if you're talking fish which are underwater and above water, loose colour and so on. But that's a practical matter. But where do the models come from? The visual models of why to depict like that? Uh, so I don't really have an answer, but this is a more dramatic situation, let's say, than the plant mm, example, mm. because of this it's break. It's absolutely new. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. New tradition of illustration in the 18th century when people start to order the material that they have through Linné, and so you have this tradition mm -hmm. of having suddenly um, reproductions in classifications, in mm -hmm. grids, which allow for the comparison of different uh, 
related species. So, yeah, uh, I think overall it's pretty much building on one visual culture or visual tradition, um, and it, it's always a process, always a um, sort of moving forward type of situation. It's not a fixed term uh, or like moment in history. And I think also we have to consider at which point did those drawings come from uh, after a lot of observations and then is this drawing made for reproduction or is it at the beginning of people trying to figure things out and all of that adds to the complication of interpretation mm -hmm. and that's why like when trying to assess these drawings we have to kind of consider all aspects as, uh, as possible. Absolutely. Okay, one, one last question, Aneta. Uh, it, it's a bit about this borderline between art and science. Uh, I, I would like to know what you think about this Japanese or Chinese tradition of... It's a bit what you said. You, you paint the grass or shelf, I don't know in English, uh, uh, shelf. Or a waterfall or whatever, mm -hmm. thousands of times, and once again and once again, and then finally you can draw it like uh, uh, without seeing, mm. with closed eyes, in uh, sort of small lines, what is the essence or the typical, maybe more the, than the typical, the essence of a plant or the, of, a, of a natural object. What do you think about this? Because this mm. is a bit going over the exact drawing, but in the same time it's, it's uh, looking for the same to find the typical essence of a plant, for example. How do you look it's, at these pictures? I will just have one comment about which is not quite the same, but about figure drawing that I think... Figure drawing, so the tradition of drawing from life in the Renaissance, which we haven't discussed, and we're... I mean, we'll talk about... Um, bodies in the medicine section, but uh, what I've seen, and this is in my own research of Michelangelo's drawings, but also Leonardo's, Raphael's drawings, all of these figures that I've studied, is that you can see when they're drawing from life, and I think they, we talked this morning about practice, and that they make hundreds of drawings with figures in front of them, but then you can also see when they shift, and that and there are pages, and this is something I looked at particularly with Michelangelo, where it's quite clear he does not have a model in front of him, and he's making little studies, and these are studies often of ignudi, and, uh, you know, so I'm going to be ignudo, you know, they're making, he, he has these figures in these kind of complex um, poses, but he's twisting and turning them around, and you can see that he's internalized, like he's, he's learned. He's learned the form of the body so well that he can manipulate it into these kind of outrageous and somewhat unlikely poses. Um, but it, it happens in his mind, it happens on the page, and it happens, as you say, through hundreds and hundreds of drawings. So I know that happens with figurative drawings um, in the Renaissance, in the 16th century, I, I'm not sure that I've seen it with botanical, or I don't, I don't know. Is that something, Florica, that you think you can see that with these artists who are, I mean, or do they, is that even a goal to kind of, because it requ it's, a, it's also speaking about abstraction, right? And I think in the, in the Chinese and Japanese tradition, that makes sense. I mean, it's quite a, something that's so beautiful in the ink paintings, this abstraction and essence. But I, I wonder, I feel like it's not, maybe it's not the goal of these 16th it's, century. It's certainly never explicit. If it was a goal, mm. I don't think anybody ever talks about that yeah. uh, in, those, in that period, let's right. say early modern period. So, mm, so, I it may, so. so I would say it may be relevant, it makes sense in the figurative realm, because artists like Michelangelo and Leonardo, Raphael had to, they wanted to invent a pose for their composition and so forth. Uh, Daniel, you had a comment? Yeah. Example before, uh, interested in your talk, uh, that also relates to the to the question, or is a remark on the question of the interrelation of knowledge and observation, um, where you kind of presented your kind of uh, design process towards the illustration. And one of the first steps, if I got that right, was analytically and abstractly uh, dissecting um, the plant into its elements. There was that's how the leaves look like. That's how um, the what the, the branches look like and everything, then to me it appeared like, okay, then you figure your 
uh, composition and you reconstruct very freely and abstractly from that um, abstract material that you've gathered on uh, apparently on the basis of language based knowledge systems that kind of allowed you to uh, dissect it in that abstract way so and that would allow for what you just mentioned Cammy, um, how you if you've got the internalized how mm -hmm. ana anatomy works that is kind of having your abstract <laughs> repertoire of elements mm -hmm. based on the language based knowledge yeah. that allows you for whatever composition you'd like yeah. to have that is a very good observation, uh, and it's perhaps a little bit of an unconscious uh, action I do, and I see a lot of my peers uh, also do without really putting it into words. Mm -hmm. But uh, not the same type of illustrations, but um, the type of images I'm looking at for my PhD, they are really more about these garden flowers. And for those, observational drawing, of course, come into a certain point. But more of it is this idealized uh, version of the bloom of the this like very peculiar specimen of a double flower. And that, a lot of times, is not direct observation of somebody really just drawing what's in front of them, but it is um, really like observing the forms and then uh, selecting the parts, mm -hmm. putting together. So it may be comparable. So, I wouldn't say it's the same there, thing, but it but does require somebody kind of internalize. So and yeah. there's abstraction exactly. taking place, which is, I think, uh, yeah. another way of putting your yeah. process. Mm -hmm. I hate to cut this off, but we are getting behind. And so let's take, I think in the program I had a 10-minute break. Let's just make it a very quick break to transition. You can get a drink of water um, but we'll, and so forth, but we'll transition to the section on um, medicine um, now. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for the, to, the, to our speakers on button. Thanks again. <laughs>